Hello, and welcome to Instant Insights. At Global Data Thematic Intelligence, we track over 100 tech, industry, ESG, and macro themes impacting all major sectors. My name is Eve Thomas, and this week I'm talking to two experts from both the World Health Organization and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies to learn more about the recent MPOX outbreak. First up, I spoke to Dr. Marka Law Widowson, High Threat Pathogens Lead at the Europe branch of the World Health Organization. I asked him to explain the basics. Where does MPOX come from and who is most impacted by the current outbreak? Right, so MPOX has been what we call endemic. In other words, it's been in the background in large parts of Central Africa for, for as long as we know, really. It's a virus that actually is, has an animal reservoir, in particular rodents. And very occasionally, over the past decades and last century, 20th century, there'd be spillovers from the rodent reservoir into to households and people would get infected and they'd have a rash-like illness, which looked a little bit like smallpox, which was eradicated in 1980, but not as severe in general. And then it would only transmit from one person to another for two or three generations and stop. So that's been going on for a long time. And when I studied these diseases, it was seen as a bit of a niche kind of disease that's, that was confined to certain areas of Central Africa. Now, what's happened since, of course, is, that, as we know with many of these viruses, they're very capricious and we never quite predict what they're going to do, is that it's kind of been changing. And what we're seeing at the moment is that instead of being just where it was previously, which is in the west part of what's known now as the Democratic Republic of Congo, where these spillover infections from rodents used to happen, now we're seeing it in areas of the DRC where it didn't have these spillover infections, that there was not traditionally MPOX areas, and we're seeing it spread easier from human to human to human than it did before. And we're seeing it spread to other countries and neighboring areas. So it's quite concerning. And this particular clade, what's going on is, is clade one, which is supposed to be more severe. Bronwyn Nicol, Senior Officer of Public Health and Emergencies at the IFRC, explained more about the clades and how the disease is changing. There are two main clades of the virus, clade one and clade two. What we're seeing, particularly in Africa, is unusual behavior within clade 1. So clade 1A, which is what typically circulates in some of the endemic countries in Africa, so in Western DRC, in Nigeria, uh, in Central African Republic. So this outbreak of clade 1A has been ongoing for a couple of years now, and it has been behaving differently than it usually has. And so people from Nigeria CDC, as well as from WHO within their, their MPOX control program, have been raising that this is different than usual, but we hadn't really been seeing much reaction to that. And then there's also what emerged last year in September 2023 is clade 1B. And this came out in South Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo in an area that is not endemic and had never had MPOX before. And 1B was behaving differently than 1A, the transmission patterns looked a bit different. And since then, we've seen 1B spread to non-endemic countries in East Africa. And there's also now been cases confirmed in one in Thailand and one in Sweden. And then we also have clade 2, which was linked to the 2022 outbreak, which is still ongoing. Uh, there's also cases of that in Africa. There is an outbreak ongoing in South Africa of clade 2 right now. And this is linked to different populations, more so in men who have sex with men. Whereas with clade 1A, it's mostly children, and clade 1B is a mix of adults and children. With MPOX behaving differently, and with cases being identified across the world, I asked Dr. Marc Alain how worried Europe and the rest of the world should be about the spread. Yeah, so I think we should always be worried when we see viruses doing funky stuff and changing what we know as the epidemiology, the way they're transmitted, the reservoirs. But also, if we look at the virus and see that there are mutations, and we talk a lot about COVID variants, for instance. So we've always got to be concerned when viruses start doing new stuff. And this is what this virus is now doing. So yes, I wouldn't say worried, because that suggests that you know we should be not sleeping at night, but we should be concerned. And, and I'm thinking about Europe. In, in Africa, the situation is more worrying, because when you have a situation where population in many communities don't have good access to basic health care, and therefore these diseases, these infections can be a lot worse. So in certain areas of the world, it's worrying. For us at the moment in Europe, it's more concerning and we need to prepare ourselves and we need to be sure that we understand what's going As the world looks to prepare itself, memories of measures taken during COVID-19 are at the forefront of many minds. I asked Bronwyn whether lessons from the pandemic are relevant to the MPOX outbreak and whether these learnings are being applied. 
well, we never really got to the end of COVID, but there have been quite a lot of reports that have come out around, you know, what we need to improve for the future. Some pieces I think we have done, we've made some progress towards some of the improvements we know we needed to make, particularly around surveillance and laboratory capacity and sharing of that information, particularly around sharing of sequencing of samples so that we know if there are mutations, what they are, how does this affect, how might this affect transmission patterns and how do we need to adapt our response according to what we're seeing. And with MPOX, this is quite important as we have the different clades. So if a country has clade two, their response is going to be quite different than if they have one B as it's not quite the same thing. But again, some pieces, I mean, we talk in the office sometimes like we feel like we're back in 2020 again at the beginning of COVID, particularly with the conversations around vaccines and treatment and what is available for the African continent. And it, you know, it's a complex issue that won't be solved quickly, but some of those lessons from COVID, we haven't quite seemed to have learned them yet. Dr. Marcalon highlighted similar points, but suggested that learning lessons together and working on a unified global response would also work to serve national interests. Well, there's several lessons from COVID, which it's a lesson that we keep on learning, really, and forgetting is that infectious diseases are unpredictable. We've always got to remember that, that we can never be happy with the status quo. We've always got to think that there are things that are going to kind of blow up in our faces, if you will, to varying degrees. Now, this is not COVID in the sense that it's not a pandemic. But nonetheless, it's that's the first lesson is that things happen, things change, new viruses come, viruses change, and they cause problems. And that's lesson number one. I think le- lesson number two is that what we haven't really done from COVID is the fact that this idea that for us all to be safe, the disease needs to be tackled globally. So the, the lesson from COVID really was that something that happens in one part of the world will very quickly affect the rest of the world. And MPOX, though it's not COVID, is still pretty nimble. I mean, you know, we've had cases of newly emerging claim in Sweden already. We had the MPOX already continues to circulate in Europe from introductions back in 2022. So the lesson that these diseases are spread globally And if we want to deal with them, we need to deal with them on a global basis. That, I think, as a global community, we're still struggling with. And it's still, we still fall back all too easily in the kind of, let's over there. You know, we don't need to worry too much about it. But actually, what we need to do now, for instance, in the case of MPOX, is to tackle it in Africa. We don't tackle it in Africa. And we don't have equitable access to vaccines and countermeasures and don't do all we can to help the communities affected with that in, in Africa. Firstly, it's the right thing to do because they're suffering, they get more severe disease. And secondly, it's just pure self-interest because by dealing with it in Africa, then we deal with it in our populations as well. Tackling the outbreak will serve communities across the world then, but it requires cooperation. Considering the role of international governments, Dr. Marcalon again highlighted the temptation to serve the electorate, but pointed out the need for equitable access to resources. To be clear, governments around the world are elected to primarily look after their populations, their electorate. I mean, that's what they've been elected to do. Now, all countries of the world are part of a global community that hopes to make the world as a whole better. And so they do have a second responsibility which is to what's going on in other places of the world. We, we care about what goes on in the rest of the world. We don't just look at our own electorate. So there's a dual responsibility. One is to make sure that your population is safe and protected and has the right amount of vaccines available to deal with what are real problems. But at the same time, purely because of self-interest, there's a responsibility, moral responsibility for governments, particularly governments which have resources, to help countries which don't have resources to deal with the outbreak because they don't have resources to help their population suffering from this. And monkeypox is, mpox is a nasty disease when it's severe. I mean, you really get these horrible lesions. And of course, you get death. You know, over 500 children have died of this. Sometimes they've died of starvation because they simply can't eat because they've got so many blisters. So it's really horrific disease. So national governments have a moral responsibility to help. And then secondly, they have, I think, a responsibility to help their own population simply by dealing with the problem in Africa. So there's a dual responsibility there that governments need to think about and not to think too much. But I understand the electoral pressure to, to worry about what's going on in your own borders. And that's understandable to a point. But it is essentially, at the end of the day, a bit self-defeating. Because if you don't tackle the problem outside your walls, eventually they'll get breached. For communities affected by MPOX, the stakes are high and international cooperation is needed to tackle the spread. There have been some early successes, however, and Bronwyn points to the importance of communication. I think what we're seeing that's working nicely at the moment is that there is a lot of open communication and sharing of data with surveillance systems being open to when they flag something and see it quite early. So it's not surprising. We see things pop up in Sweden and Thailand, and it's quite nice that it has been flagged quite early 
One of the pieces that I think we still need to work towards is more around equitable access and not thinking of things as, you know, us versus their mentality in terms of where things are happening and when we start to be concerned about something. So that is sort of our global collective responsibility to not think of it as us first for our own countries. And then also just making sure we're, we're working with communities as well, since this is where, you know, epidemics begin and end in communities and uh, making sure that community needs are taken into account that we're not just driving a response sort of from a national level, but we make sure that we're addressing the concerns of communities that are affected. There are significant challenges to managing the MPOX outbreak. I asked Bronwyn to explain which she considered to be the biggest obstacles. I think there's a few different ones. The one, I mean, that people are talking about right now is, again, the equitable access to, to things like testing, treatment, and vaccine. There have been pledges of vaccine stocks to be delivered to Africa, but I mean, that's less than 15% of what we need. One of the vaccines is a two-dose regimen, so that also means more is needed if we're going to be able to deliver on what, what is needed in these countries. Besides just the vaccines themselves, there's also all the support that needs to go in, whether it's cold chain management, the logistics of moving the vaccines, making sure that they're accepted by communities. We know there was a lot of mistrust with vaccines from COVID. We'll see the same thing. We're already hearing some of the same things around MPOX vaccine as well, even though it's not widely available. So making sure we get ahead of some of that. The other piece with MPOX is around stigma and also misinformation. What we're seeing pop up again, because a lot of people heard about the outbreak in 2022 and associate it with sexual transmission and men who have sex with men. What we're seeing right now, like if we take Burundi, for example, most of the cases are children. So we're not looking at the same transmission patterns. We're not looking at the same populations of concern. And so making sure, yes, we're still talking about MPOX, but there's different populations depending on what we're talking about, which can be confusing and complicated. So making sure we're clear in our communication and making sure we also address stigma that is associated with most diseases anyway for patients and for their families who are still at home. So trying to keep that sort of at the center of, of everything we're doing. One other piece I think related to that is also the piece around international interest. Again, this didn't come out of nowhere yesterday. Ministries of Health in Africa have been talking about MPOX. The, the international health community has been talking about MPOX. We knew there was something weird going on. Just no one really seemed to care and, until it moved out of the area as it typically is, uh, which is kind of also what we see all the time with all disease, but just trying to get some of that early action to be more central in everything we do for our epidemic and pandemic preparedness and response. Dr. Marc Alain also considered the challenges presented by the MPOX outbreak. On Bronwyn's point about the vaccines, he points to the World Health Organization's call for a pandemic treaty, explaining why it is needed and what it would do for MPOX affected communities. So we really need to have a, a proper mechanism and a legal mechanism by which countries will provide support to countries that can't afford to or don't have the resources or don't have the access to vaccines and diagnostics. Even the basic stuff like knowing if a person actually has MPOX or not needs a test, and these countries don't even have a test. They don't have the protective gear sometimes to deal with patients. So there's some very basic things that need to be addressed. And I think some of this can be addressed in what we're arguing for at WHO is a pandemic treaty, which is a legal document, which kind of makes governments obliged to do it and automatically help countries. The second challenge is once the resources are in the country, there is a purely logistical challenge of actually getting to some of these communities, because some of these communities are very impoverished, they're quite rural, and there's a degree of distrust sometimes of strangers. Some of them are in areas which have been plagued by, by civil war. So there's a whole access issue. Some of them are actually areas where there's been previous outbreaks in Ebola. So these are communities that have had several tough outbreaks and, and diseases to deal with. And the reason is it's sometimes difficult to get to them. And so there's a whole logistic area, which is a challenge for us to properly deal with the virus and the infection in those communities that are most affected. Considering Dr. Marc Alain's role as the high threat pathogens lead, I asked him whether he thinks it's likely that we will see more outbreaks of rare diseases such as MPOX. I think we are. And there's probably two or three reasons for that. Firstly, I think we're better at detecting stuff now. I mean, we have more diagnostics, we are more aware, we do tests more, so we're going to start noticing more things. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, of course, you've got things like climate change going on. So you've got vectors that are changing. So let's just take dengue, for instance, which is, traditionally isn't really a big problem in Europe. But the mosquito, as Europe warms up, eventually then the vector that transmits would spread. So we'll see more of dengue, for instance, in areas, or even potentially malaria in the areas that we haven't seen. So there's that whole area. And then there's also the third reason, 
is things like biodiversity. If you reduce biodiversity, what tends to happen is that you get common species which carry viruses. Most of the bad viruses, if you will, are actually quite commonly found species because there's no point having a virus that infects snow leopards only because there's not enough snow leopards. So they tend to, to infect bats and rodents and things which are quite commonly known as vectors of disease. And if you get rid of biodiversity, these common species will tend to proliferate because there's, there's less competition for food. And with that comes more diseases. So you've got climate change, and you've got lack of biodiversity. Deforestation is going to mean that where populations are digging into areas where they haven't been traditionally. So all these factors, I think, do mean that we're more likely to get um, these unusual diseases affecting us. Thank you to both of our guests for their invaluable insights today. As the MPOX outbreak continues, it's been great to hear more about the risks posed by the disease and the resources needed to effectively tackle it. From the World Health Organization, Dr. Mark Alain Widowson has explained how MPOX spreads and what the World Health Organization believes needs to be done to tackle it. From the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Bronwyn Nicholl has highlighted the need for equitable access to healthcare and has pointed out some of the biggest challenges. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you again to our guests and thank you everyone for listening. From us in Thematic Intelligence, see you next time.